Hello, this is Marsh from Miami and Gigantic, and welcome to part six. Midway through the process of comparing Back to Eden versus Fall Leaves. I have a list of questions that we're going to be answering and also 10 helpful tips to improve the Back to Eden method and also planting in fall leaves. I am located in Zone 6B in the state of New Jersey and uh, just to go over some of the basics that we started here, we have 50 feet wide and 300 feet long of wood chips that are at least 10 inches to 12 inches thick and also to our left hand side we have fall leaves. Both of them were delivered last October to November. The fall leaves are again anywhere from 7 inches to 10 inches thick. Neither side was tilled or eroded tilled or have been touched in the field. It's been sitting here for two years just growing a cover crop and we just added the wood chips and leaves on top by layering. There is no tilling or rototilling. I have a list of 12 questions that we'll be going over and adding uh, comments to and also helpful tips. Now the first question is, is cost. Uh, it's free, of course, so both of them we're going to be scaling on 1 to 10, so both is going to receive a 10 on each one. So our next question is easy to move. Now, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'm going to put the leaves as a number 8 because they're lighter weight, and I'm going to put the wood chips as a 7 because it's not easy to get a shovel into the wood chips as you know and it's not easy to move them around you pretty much need a pitchfork all the time and it's a lot of work so the third question is stays in place so now the wood chips oh that's a definite 10 that's easy the wood chips will stay in place. The only time I've ever seen the wood chips move is, like I said, the other day we got three inches of rain uh, and it just could not go through the wood chips as quick enough, but it did a really good job staying in place still and some of them were floating around, but they didn't move so much. They kind of just rose off the ground a little bit and just floated around in place in the puddle. So here's tip number one on easy to move. You do not have to apply cardboard or paper or anything underneath the wood chips prior to putting it to the ground. The only thing you have to do to be on the safe side if you don't want anything coming up is to make the wood chips just a thicker layer. You can go up to almost 10 inches or even more and where your planting area is, just remove that area so it's about four to five inches after a month or so after the wood chips are sitting there so it will kill off everything underneath. You're never going to kill off thistles or uh, certain types of weeds that are just large roots. The cardboard will not slow them down. They will stay there even after the cardboard decomposes. Thistles can last almost a year, the root in the ground. So it's not going to help. So again, avoid putting cardboard down. If you wish to, that's your choice, but it's not necessary. So leaves, where are we going to rank the leaves at to stay in place? I'm going to give that a four. For a simple reason, it's very difficult in the fall time to keep those leaves from blowing away when you have them in a pile. So tip number two, you can shred your leaves and wet them and they will stay in place a lot better. Or just if you don't wish to shred them, you can just keep them wet all the time. They will stick to each other very, very nicely. If you find it difficult to keep them wet all the time, there's another low cost solution. You can go out and buy bird netting. This is the netting that goes on top of uh, blueberry bushes or apple trees. It's kind of a plastic mesh that will uh, sit on top of the uh, plants to keep the birds from flying in. I believe the inch openings are probably like the three quarter inch or half inch openings. Now that can just sit on top of the leaves. You just stake it in a couple places, put your leaves underneath and then just put the netting on top and hold it in place over the winter until next spring when you need them. So our next question is, keeps the soil moist. The wood chips I'm gonna give a nine to. For the simple reason, you move them out of the way just an inch below and they are moist. Wood chips, you remove that one inch top layer. There we go. And you have all that nice, moist wood chips sitting there waiting for you. And fall leaves, I'm gonna give that a five. Because you can see that with the fall leaves here, 
that you have to go down quite a bit to get to that moisture. And they're light and fluffy, so I don't believe that they're going to hold the same amount of moisture as the wood uh, chips that are more dense. Just simply is because the material is just a lighter weight material and is not as dense as the wood chips. But the ultimate true test to the leaves being moist, the wood chips being moist, is when we get into the hot summer days and we go without a week of rain. I will get out the uh, soil moisture meter and we will measure exactly which is doing better, the wood chips or leaves, to be determined. And tip number three is a very simple one. Keep your soil covered at all times. Whether it's wood chips or leaves that you're using, it is so beneficial to the soil food web to keep your soil covered, to keep it moist, to keep everything alive in that soil. All those microorganisms and uh, arthropods and nematodes that are in the ground there live in an aquatic situation. They have to have moisture or water to move around and feed off each other. So it's so important to keep your ground covered at all times. Question five, holds water. What I mean by this, after it rains or during the rainstorm, does it stop the water from running off so quickly that it doesn't uh, go into the ground? After watching this for the last several uh, months of it raining, I believe that both the wood chips and the leaves do an excellent job. They're both going to get a 10 by taking that water or moisture and keeping it in that area for a longer period of time. Not too long that will cause drowning of the plants, but also that it will keep in the area from not running off and keep that uh, ground moisture. So you're really conserving water and you're building up water inside the wood chips that are decomposing and also inside the leaves. Question number six is decomposing rate. Now in the wood chips, you'll be quite surprised. Now, the reason why is that the regular wood chip itself, let me grab one, like this one I'm showing here. This one, you can see is probably from the inner part of a tree, uh, more than say uh, five inches thick or, or a branch or anything else either too. Something like this has a carbon to nitrogen ratio of about, say, 500 to 600, which is very high, which is going to be around for a long, long time to, before it decomposes. But the best thing, and that is hopeful in the wood chips that you get, is that you get an assortment of things. And I'll explain. Inside your wood chips, besides getting the leaves of the green material, you'll be getting sticks. And this is very valuable. Any stick or branch that's less than two inches has not formed into a heavy uh, carbon or nitrogen ratio wood yet. So these will decompose. These are about 50 to 60 carbon to nitrogen ratio. So this will decompose a little bit quicker and these have more minerals available quicker to the soil because of that decomposing rate of 60, 50 to 60 that can actually will aid the plants that you have in your garden. So I'm going to give our wood chips a five in decomposing but also our leaves here I know just from my experience by the end of the season you're lucky if after say maybe uh, this being 7 to 10 inches, you'll have left at the end of, like, say, August, September, there might be an inch left. So we're going to go with probably a 8 on that. So tip number four is you have a very lower rate of carbon to nitrogen ratio in uh, twigs or branches that are less than two inches. And they will decompose a lot quicker, giving more minerals to your soil and also to your plants. So we're halfway through the questions, and I noticed after looking at my twigs here, I'm right in front of my strawberry patch here, or some of them. I got planted a couple of different places, and look at that. I'm going to take a little bit of a break here, and we'll, I'll be back in a second after enjoying that beautiful strawberry. My very first strawberry. Oh, that was good. That was purely filled with water and sugar. Question number seven, any bad type of wood chips or leaves? Absolutely not. The only thing you're going to run in problems with is sawdust. 
Now sawdust is very fine. That's that high carbon to nitrogen ratio. That's going to, if you just put sawdust on top of your ground and you went to go plant something, then it's going to rob your soil of nitrogen and cold nitrogen deficiency. Not wood chips or any other thing. It's when you go into that very small particles of that denser wood that's in the middle of the tree, that 600 to one ratio, that carbon to nitrogen ratio, that's going to zap that ground and not allow your plants to grow or cause a nitrogen deficiency. And the other thing you want to stay away from is bark chips. Those large pieces of bark that are on certain trees, you do not wish to have them. They are not helpful to you at all. So tip five, you're going to stay away from large bark chips. That's the outside layer and also from sawdust. And there is no type of leaves that are bad for your soil or for growing things in. I have a mixture of oak, maple, uh, pine needles, uh, you name it, it's all in there. There's probably at least 20 different variety of leaves that I get in from the park system. Question eight, weeds growth. You are going to get weeds. And then here's a prime example. These wood chips are 10 inches thick and the weed is about a foot tall with lots of seeds ready to drop again, which we'll be pulling out of here and removing shortly. Weeds are meant to go to places that are barren, that are pure wood chips and leaves. The th reason for this is simple, is that it wants to establish a root system in that ground to get that soil biology back working again. Because really right now, you have no living life in the soil except some uh, fungus and bacteria. The soil food web is not working properly, and I'll explain that in the further questions. But weeds help bring soil back to life. And here's a perfect example. I had to build up some soil, so I brought some soil in. Whenever you move soil, you're going to re-encourage weeds to grow. Now, in the middle, that large leaf in the middle, right here, is a strawberry plant. And all around it is weeds. Now, I will go back and I will trim these weeds. I will not pull them out. I will cut them short to the ground and reapply wood chips around the whole area. The reason I'm doing this is because all those roots reopened up that soil again for me quicker than I could ever do. It is a natural tiller. So tip number six, use weeds properly. Let them grow for a little bit, trim them close to the ground as close as possible, then add your wood chips on top. And let the, all that material that you cut away, if there's no seeds in, in it, let them decay right there in place and then cover with wood chips. You are in control of your garden, not the weeds. So this is how I clean up a lot of weeds in my garden or on the farm. It's a lot easier. It's a little handheld device. It's just a little clipper, rechargeable, and works pretty easily. And another nice strawberry. Delicious. Now you can see I chopped all the weeds down. I'll go back in another, like say, two, three days if I see any regrowth. And then I'll cover it up with wood chips. And they'll pretty much stay uh, hidden probably much for the rest of the year. Thanks. So if somebody mentions to you that wood chips or mulching is a weed-free area, it reduces them. It's always going to grow weeds. You have to look out for them. Um, it's going to be helpful that you have the chips down and, and the leaves down to cover the soil. But weeds, again, are made to grow everywhere. If you ever see weeds, they'll grow in the crack of a driveway, crack of a sidewalk, you name it. They will find their place in your garden. It's just a matter of time before they get there. So we're just going to give both the back to Eden and the fall leaves just a one for each side on a weed's growth. 
So here we have our outside temperature, which is the big white box thermometer, and that says it's 76 degrees, and our soil temperature is 78 degrees on the right-hand side. The battery is starting to go, I don't know if it looks like it's 16 or 18 degrees, but there is a 7 there. So it's 78 degrees, it can't be 18 degrees. Um, so anyway, soil temperature is very important. The best soil temperature that you want is to be around 70 degrees. Now right now you can see that the soil temperature is higher than that because it's not covered by wood chips. You want to go out and measure in your garden every so often that your soil temperature is between 70 and maybe max 75. If it's higher than that, basically what you want to do is add more chips and so you keep more moisture in the ground so it radiates the heat away from that. The optimum temperature for plants to grow and to be healthy healthy is around 70 degrees. Anything in the 80 degree, 90 degree, or 100, because you're those days that it gets to be 100 degrees out and that sun's hitting that bare soil, that plant, if you give it water, only 15% of that water is actually going to the plant. The rest of it is either perspiring off the plant and only 15% of the plant is using that water that you're giving it to it because it can't it can't store it long enough because it's so hot. Now you can see I moved the gauge over, the temperature gauge, and it says 70 degrees. That's a little on the outside edge of where the soil meets the wood chip. So you can see how the difference is just by that uh, probably eight inches difference. And it's a seven degrees because the wood chips are covering that soil. And you can see here in the leaves, it's a little bit less. I think that's just due because there's more coverage on the leaves. But also, all those in-between air gaps, I think leaves actually give it a better insulating. But we're going to find out further in the summertime uh, by more accurate measurements. But we're going to give both of them uh, a 10. I'm going to take a moment. These are squash plants planted in this row here. And this is the second row over in the wood chip area in the back to Eden. I'm going to take you back in time this morning. Uh, this morning I went out and I videotaped how I planted these squash plants in the wood chips and also the leaves. And after that you will come right back. Here we are on Thursday morning. It's about 7 o'clock in the morning. Uh, hopefully the sun will come out later in the day. But it's a good day for transplanting. We're going to be planting about 120 squash plants, 60 on both sides. Uh, the one side is the back to Eden, the wood chips. And also we're going to be planting uh, 60 on the other side of the uh, fall leaves with the cover crop growing into it. Both sides are going to get the same amount, like I said, 60 each of four different varieties. I have my little uh, portable greenhouse I rolled out in front of the field where we have our 120 squash plants. So let's take a closer look. So we're in our little portable greenhouse on our wagon. We have eight trays. There's 15 four-inch pots in each tray. And some are missing. Uh, some, it's not that they didn't come up. We had a little bit of a mice problem that we're eating the seeds. So we're missing a few plants here and there. But uh, this only seems like to be one or two per tray. Each side is going to receive four trays of 15, and the first 15 is going to be yellow squash, and then it was just goldy. Then we have our green zucchini, we have our spaghetti squash, and we have our butternut squash. And those are 15 each of everything too, so that's a total of 60, and both sides will receive the same. So let me show you how I'm going to plant them, and then I have a lot of work to do today. So here's our first row in the Back to Eden garden. Uh, we're going to plant the squash, it seems like, about every uh, five feet, so there's plenty of room in between them, so for good air circulation. And also later on, I will also be planting some nasturtion in with them also too, which is an edible flower, and it's supposed to keep the squash bugs away. I'm not too sure about that, but uh, it also looks good. So in this one particular row, I had to actually bring in some uh, leaf mold and raise it up a little bit more than it was there on the ground. For a simple reason, we had gotten three inches of rain the other day and it had basically was just sitting there in that ditch. Um, that means that that soil is compact and we'll explain it more uh, in other details in the other part of this video of why it is compact and how it got that way and how we're going to cure it. But also, too, is so we have to kind of raise it almost like a little bit of a raised bed before we plant our squash into it. 
Here we have our tray of squash, and you can see that some of the leaves, the bottom leaves are turning yellow. That's perfectly fine. They're not the set of the first true leaves. Uh, they will naturally fall off. They're just there, but eventually they will go away and it'll just decompose in the ground. So let's just plant up one. It's simply moving that soil aside. I don't add anything to it. It's just gonna be the, the same soil that's in the ground. And there's a, probably a little bit of leaf mold now mixed in with it. This is my first transplant in the row. This is the golden squash, and you can see the yellow leaves. And now there's two plants in there. I'm not gonna pinch one off yet. I'm gonna see which one grows better out there, or I might even leave both growing. Um, I've done it before, and I've actually had three in a pot, and all three survived, and uh, we'll talk about that some other time, about how good of a root system you can get going here, where you can have three squash plants planted within maybe, say, two inches of each other, and they do just fine and it's a huge plant and you get three times the amount of produce. I didn't rewater this morning because I wanted you to see this. This is strictly grown in leaf mold. Uh, the whole plant here you can see is just planted in leaf mold and then I have worm castings on the very top here. That black edge on worm castings and you can see that everything is very nicely growing here just in the leaf mold by itself. I That's my own potting soil. Um, it's actually two-year-old leaf mold. You can see how, again, well it does. So we're just gonna reach in, dig a little bit of a hole, plant at the same height, and that's it. We'll get rid of them. And that's step number one. Here I am in the leaf field, the fall leaves, and we're gonna be planting our squash in the same way uh, we plant them in the wood chips. In here, we'll dig down, and I'll show you how thick the leaves are, and we'll make a uh, quite uh, an area where we're going to remove the leaves. We probably have to go like a foot and a half in diameter because they're so thick, so we get sunlight down to the plant, because we have to be planting them not in the leaf mold itself, but in actually the soil. So let's dig a hole in our leaf mold. And you see that the leaves are about, oh, let's say six to seven inches thick. We'll get some more out of the way here. Now we have our soil. So this is going to be a good shot. We're going to break that up a little bit. There's no other way to get that transplant in the ground. Now we have our golden squash. Let's take that out of the pot. And you can see again too, that, let it focus for a second here. You can see that it's just leaf mold again also. There's nothing there except our worm castings on top. We'll break off the roots on the bottom a little bit. And you can see I can open this up here. That's just strictly leaf mold that I use. That's, again, like my potting soil. Now we're going to take that and place it into the hole. Now, since it's going to rain tonight or tomorrow, oh, come on. since it's going to rain tonight or tomorrow, um, I'm not worried about watering it, and plus the ground is very wet, but I should water it in. You should always water them in. And the leaves here, I would say, are about, say, seven inches thick. Uh, again, I do not till the soil. I don't rototill the leaves into the soil. We just layer the leaves on top of the soil, and then we remove them, and then just like the wood chips, uh, so it will be the same comparison. And then we just push the leaves aside like you see, and then we plant our plant. 
I hope you enjoyed that early morning video. And now we're going to go to the next question here. Question 10, soil pH. So let's take a look at our gauge in the soil. So we have our soil pH gauge sitting next to our uh, strawberry plant that we cut the weeds around. And let's go take a closer look. So here's our soil gauge. It's reading about 6.2. It's a little on the low side. So what I'm going to do, uh, and that's due to because the ground is not covered and those wood chips aren't working with that fungus in there to keep that soil pH balanced. So that's another reason why you want to keep your soil covered. Without that covering on the soil, you are actually changing the life in the soil, thus you're changing the pH in the soil. Now here we have it in a leaf section. We move the leaves out of the way. I have it placed in the soil and it's right at 6.8 and that's a good pH level because the soil was covered and everything was working in the soil to maintain that pH. So on the soil pH we're going to give 9 to the fall leaves and we're going to have a question mark on the soil pH on the back to Eden because we're going to come back after we apply the wood chips in two weeks and take a re-measurement of that to see what the pH is. So question 11, are we building soil? The answer is no, we are not building soil. We're only going to give it a 1 on both of them for a simple reason, we are not inducing mycorrhizal fungi in the system. If you just put wood chips down or leaves, there is nothing in that's going to happen to build soil aggregates. So that's a part of building soil that you need the most to have the water flow through the soil structure, to add carbon to the soil, to add life to the soil, everything. To have roots go in there, to have that mycorrhizal fungi to grow, and also so that produces glomalin, and that makes those aggregates stick together. So we're going to give that a one on both. So if we're not building soil, how are the plants surviving or doing well? Like the potatoes, the strawberries, the squashes, anything that you plant into it. Basically what you're doing is you're adding a layer of compost and letting it decay. In that process, especially in the wood chips and the leaves, you're forming humic acid. And it's really compost tea that is feeding those roots. But also, too, you're also building up fungus, not mycorrhizal fungi, but just the regular fungus that will open up the soil very, very little so the fungus root can get down there and the bacteria and the other fungus can get back down there. But you need a living root to get the mycorrhizal fungi available in your soil. And then you have a good building soil structure. So tip number eight is, do you have to add manure to your back to eating garden or to fall leaves? No. And a lot of people I just say is, why not? Is For simple reason is, it's not necessary. Most manure is a high salt content. Unless you have your own manure for your own chickens or your own livestock and you have it aged, then it's proper to put in the ground. But it's not necessary. If you wish to get rid of it that way to put in your garden, that's fine. But it's again, it's not necessary. It doesn't do anything except make the plants be dependent on that manure instead of getting larger root system it will have a smaller root system because the minerals are right there for it and you want a larger root system on every one of your plants to keep it healthy so question 12 are we adding liquid carbon to the soil no we are not not a good thing again too the only way liquid carbon gets into soil is through a living plant Plants rely on the soil. The soil to a plant is more important than the plant itself. The plant will give 51% of its energy to the soil. It will make sure that the soil is functioning 100% all the time. It will always sacrifice itself. And the soil wants to keep the plant alive also because without it, it can't get the liquid carbon that it needs. And that carbon is the carbon that's in our atmosphere that we have too much today on. So I wish to thank everybody out there who is doing gardening on a small scale, whether it's in a bucket on a patio or else too, you're taking 
carbon out of the atmosphere, liquid carbon, through that plant, processing it, and putting it back into your soil. Now, some instances it's doing better and some less, but whatever effort you're doing, it's at least it's something. So to get liquid carbon in the ground and also building up mycorrhizal fungi, I wanted to plant sunflowers. But we had a family of groundhogs and they were eating them all. So I decided to go a different route. I came with the idea of planting little miniature pine trees every five feet. And that would do the same function. It's a living root in the ground. Uh, 365 days a year and it will encourage mycorrhizal fungi plus add liquid carbon to the soil and start building soil for me. Now there's other examples I'm going to show you. The other examples where you can see is the strawberries that will add carbon, liquid carbon and also at the end of the field here let's take a walk down there and I'll show you we're doing something unique down there too. So in our rows here that we wanted to supply uh, mycorrhizal fungi in there, instead of growing sunflowers, a, uh, one of the people that watched my channel was nice enough to come up with an idea of planting sunchokes, and that was Noah Beach. And it's a beautiful idea. Sunchokes are as part of the sunflower family, and we'll be doing the same thing by putting liquid carbon back in the ground and also encouraging mycorrhizal fungi. We have several down the row, as you can see here. There's another cluster there. They're about 20 feet apart. I know they'll grow tall and we'll put cages around them. We can also trim them. But their main purpose is, is to, again, is to start building soil around that area. And tip number 10 is very simple. In a large area where you have all these wood chips and you're just gonna plant individual things in it, monocropping, like I did, there's nothing that's a beneficial insect area. So you have to go in there and every so often, like I says, this is where I'm gonna plant my cucumbers. And you can see here is that I interplanted some, uh, this is winter rye and crimson clover. And you can see that flower starting to form there and they will bring in more beneficial insects. Not so much the flowers, but you're adding a living crop that they can hide in the ladybugs at night and they can maintain their shelter in there. It's a home for them. They need something like that. That's also the reason for this other, this is mammoth clover here and that's about let's say almost two feet tall and that's on the outside edge and in between the rows here is crimson clover too. That's why in the leaves I planted all that cover crop because there's all things living there, spiders that catch things, you name it. It's living in there just like in a regular field and you're catching every single one of those beneficial insects to come in and feel comfortable there and eat the bad bugs. I wish to thank you for watching this video. I know it's quite long but I'm glad I went over all the points so you can see and understand and I appreciate all the questions that will be coming my way uh, soon through after watching this video. I wish to learn more and so please ask me questions if you have any that you are thinking of just write it in the comment box below. And again I wish to thank you and if you haven't done so please subscribe. Thanks.